Well, hello, hot people. <laughs> that was a compliment. Light Bearers uh, 2022 Convocation, welcome. I am personally glad you are here. Listen, this is the Light Bearers 2022 Convocation, um, also known as an accidental weight loss program. <laughs> I am losing weight as we speak, which is a good thing if you knew my situation. <laughs> But I brought this just in case. Uh, we're going to have a great time together exploring the book of Exodus, but I want to begin in this opening session by introducing you to some people I love dearly. Is that okay? Do you like loving people that other people are really impressed with? So you, you're going to meet, if you haven't already, one of them this evening right after I speak, and uh, the other two are equally lovable. These are the Rosario brothers. See, you automatically did that. I didn't even prompt you. Their photo is up and you automatically said, aww. Because here's the thing about the Rosario brothers. They're adorable. They're adorable. But for years and years and years, I've known them for a long time, and for years I've been under the impression that the Rosario brothers, Yamil, who is behind the scenes with the light bearers, the rest of the light bearers team orchestrating this whole thing, and, and Jeffrey, who will be up after me, and then Jay, their little brother who's pastoring down in Florida. I've been under the impression all these years that the Rosario brothers are uniquely adorable. <laughs> but that illusion was shattered recently because I went to the Dominican Republic, where they're from, and I was surrounded by smiles and dimples and beautiful thousand-watt personalities everywhere I went. So it turns out they're not, they're, they're just run-of-the-mill Dominicans, <laughs> which is a good thing <laughs> because they're beautiful humans. But here's the thing about the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is a story in which the exact opposite is the case. The exact opposite. The God that is the central figure, the central character in the book of Exodus is, in the most extreme sense you can imagine, distinct, special, and completely other than the antagonistic characters in the narrative. Are you tracking with me? So in the story, we're going to encounter Yahweh as the central figure, and Pharaoh, the antagonist in the story on the human plane of reality. That language will mean something more as we proceed. So you have Yahweh versus Pharaoh. And they're not just different in some kind of minor sense, they are utterly and completely different. Yahweh is distinct, special, unique, and completely other than what's going on in the deep inner psychology and emotionality and relationality of Yahweh. Pharaoh's different in every way, in character. But behind Pharaoh, in the narrative, as we're going to discover, there is this group, it's plural, this group of gods called the gods of Egypt sometimes, and sometimes called just the gods. So these gods are really on the spiritual plane of reality, as we're going to discover. These gods are really the antagonistic forces behind the scenes and Pharaoh is their host. Pharaoh is their vehicle. Pharaoh is simply the human being on the earthly plane that is being used by powers that exist on the spiritual plane of reality. Now, this is going to become more clear as we proceed. But Yahweh versus Pharaoh... Yahweh versus the gods of Egypt and the gods in general. Now watch this. Yahweh 
is a particular kind of person, a particular kind of being, which is to say that Yahweh thinks and feels and relates out of the abundance, out of the abundance of the beauty of his character. God is something on the inside that comes out in the way he engages, in the way he interacts. We're talking about the character of God. And God, distinct from Pharaoh and the gods of Egypt, operate in different ways. So really the story, as you're probably already aware, if you've even read the book of Exodus in a cursory manner, just, just one pass and you'll discover, oh, wait a minute, the real issue at play here is that Pharaoh and the gods operate with oppression. They exploit, they commodify, they use people for the advancement of their diabolical and evil designs. And again, this is introductory, this is session one out of 12. This will become clearer as we go along. Now my task this evening, my assignment, is to give an overview of the book of Exodus so we know what we're looking for, right? The key elements of the story, but also to move through in a systematic way, chapter one of Exodus. So the review will be embedded into our time together in this first chapter. Notice chapter one, verse one of Exodus. This is astounding. The opening word in my version that I use most commonly, the New King James Version, the opening word is now. That's the, the first word. Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. But in the Hebrew and in the literal translations of the Bible, the most literal ones, the opening word of the book of Exodus is the word and. When's the last time you opened a book and the opening word is and? Now, anybody who has an elementary grasp of grammar knows that the word and is pointing which way? Backwards, something has occurred. Right? There's a backstory. And so what's happening is that the book of Exodus is really a part two of Genesis. It's a continuation of the story that was just told in the book of Genesis. Look at this. The book of Genesis basically closes. This is the third to the last verse. It says, and Joseph said to his brothers, I'm dying, but God will surely visit you. And notice the language bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. So what's happening here? Genesis just closed with Joseph essentially prophesying before his death and saying, you're here in Egypt, but God's going to bring you out, bring you out of Egypt. And these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt, but they're coming out. So essentially, in a visual that we can wrap our minds around, and I hope you brought your handy dandy booklet so that you can take notes, Genesis gives birth to Exodus. You can't understand the book of Exodus without grasping the backstory in the book of Genesis. Just can't do it. Now, when we say this, we mean more than just book, book. Follow this, and in your notes, there is a conceptual backdrop. There's something going on conceptually in the book of Genesis that gives birth to the conceptual terrain of the narrative of Exodus. And what I mean by that is this. In Genesis, we encounter essentially this story. Creation, are you with me? The fall, and then God responding to the fall of mankind by entering into covenant with humanity, first in Genesis 3, as we'll see in a moment, and then most significantly in the most concrete form, entering into covenant relationship with a man named Abraham. Abram, and his name will be changed to Abraham. And that covenant 
is the backdrop. That's the conceptual narrative terrain that you have to understand in order for Exodus to make any sense at all. Creation, fall, covenant. Now, the word Exodus itself is a very simple word. I mean, you go into buildings and you see a sign over doors that say exit. This word, even though it's in the Hebrew Old Testament, this word comes to us from the Latin and then into the Greek, and it's composed of two words, ex, which just means out, and hodas, which means road or way or path. So the word exodus very simply, if you understand this one concept, you pretty much have the lens that will allow you to make sense out of everything else that's going on. You don't even need to, I was going to say, attend the rest of these 12 sessions, but <laughs> I want to encourage you to attend all 12 sessions. But you will have the raw materials conceptually, theologically, if you understand this one concept. Exodus means the way out, the road out, and here's essentially what it looks like. This is what's going on in the book of Exodus. The way out is through blood, baptism in the Red Sea, which is Paul's interpretation of the Red Sea. Were they not all baptized, Paul says, in the sea, in the Red Sea? So this is a theological interpretation that Paul is making of what they experienced. Watch this. The blood on the door, the two sides of the door and over the door, was the first step in the passage, the road, the way out. Through blood, through water, and through obedience, at Mount Sinai, God gave a law. Now, lest we misunderstand what's going on in the text, I'm giving additional language, all of which is drawn from the text, right, of Exodus and the narrative that built. So the first step in the way out is blood, by which we mean in the book of Exodus, redemption. And redemption gives rise to rebirth through the waters of the Red Sea. You have a nation that is being actualized or birthed into existence. Prior to this, Israel's not a nation. They're, they're a group of people. They're a tribe. They're a group of people that are in a foreign land. And they're in slavery. They're not a nation yet. They're becoming a nation in the Exodus story. They're, they're redeemed to nationhood, to become a particular kind of people and that law that God gave them, to which we often apply the word obedience, which is a good word in this context, is, we discover in the text, and will discover, is love in action. Redemption, rebirth, into a whole new way of being human that is defined by love. By loving God supremely and our fellow human beings as ourselves. This is the book of Exodus. And that event called the Passover with the blood on the posts of the door and over the door, that was pointing forward to the redemptive act where blood was shed, the cross of Calvary. So now we're looking at the theological interpretation. Historically, the cross, and after Jesus died on the cross, he was resurrected, reborn, to new life into which we're invited ourselves in his ascension. So that Paul comes along and says, Jesus died as the representative head of all human beings. Jesus was resurrected as the representative of all human beings. And Paul says, Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, which is the victory position, the position of favor. Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father, and Paul says, we're there with him seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, is Paul's exact language. We're there in our representative head. An actual specimen of the human race occupies the throne of the universe right now. And he's there awaiting our arrival to rule and reign over the universe with him. He's waiting for us to get there with him through blood and water, through blood and baptism, through redemption and rebirth, 
through the cross and resurrection. So then the next thing that we notice in Exodus chapter 1 is that the backstory of Genesis is embedded in the first verse. And these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. And then it gives all the names, you know, those parts of the Bible called the genealogies. That if you are lazy some afternoon and really want to invoke a nap, <laughs> just read the genealogies. You'll go fast to sleep. But they're there for a reason. In fact, let me tell you an interesting little fact about the book of Exodus. We know it as the book of Exodus. But if you were to go to a Jewish synagogue, the second book of the Bible is not called, it doesn't bear the name, Exodus. The name of the second book of the Bible for Israel, for the Hebrew people, is the names, the book of names, which they drew the title straight from verse 1. They said, what is this book about? What should we call this book? Well, it's a book of names. Why are the names important? Well, because it goes back to the story that is unfolding in Genesis. Creation, fall. Now watch this, you guys. After the fall of mankind, the first gospel promise and prophecy is articulated as a prophecy about lineages, about succession of birth. Watch this, Genesis 3.15, and I will put enmity, hostility, between you, he's addressing the serpent. By the way, interesting detail, the serpent is the host, like Pharaoh is the host of a demonic power. So I will put enmity between you, serpent, and the woman, in the local immediate historical sense, this is Eve, but Eve is going to give birth to children, Yes? And they're going to give birth to children, and there's going to be a division of hostility and enmity that is going to define human history. Just spend 10 minutes on the internet watching the news, and you'll see the enmity that is defining the human race down through history, right? So I, God, Yahweh, I will put enmity between the serpent and the woman, notice this, between your seed... The devil has seed, progeny. One version says offspring. Well, obviously, while there is a genetic part of the story with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, we discover as the story unfolds that we're not dealing primarily with a genetic line. The devil, Satan, the fallen angel, has no human progeny in a strict biological sense. Are you catching that? Okay, so, but he has seed, nonetheless. He has, he has ideological seed. He has theological seed. So, I will put imagery between serpent, the devil, your seed, and hers, the woman's, and he, now it becomes singular. He, seed, plural, and now seed, singular, he, some he, is going to come through the lineage of the woman, not the serpent, and crush the head of the serpent and be wounded on his heel in the process of conquering the devil and evil. This is the first gospel promise. And it is a promise, it is a prophecy of seed versus seed. That is to say offspring versus offspring. Lineage versus lineage. You can illustrate it like this, and I won't go through all the details here, although I would love to so much, I can just taste it. Here is, now that slide's a little too big. What you don't see on the screen in front of you is that the first box over there, which I can see, is serpent, put it in your notes, serpent woman. Genesis 3.15. The seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. Are you tracking with me? But then the serpent has a lineage, progeny, seed, conceptual, theological, ideological seed. Cain, who is against or versus Abel. You have Lamech, who is against Seth in the lineage. 
you have all flesh that is corrupted, and you have Enoch and Noah, right? Are you tracking with how the story unfolds? And you have Ham and Canaan. You have Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, who then is the founder of the first oppressive empire, Babel. Are you still with me? Assyria comes in the biblical, this is all in Genesis, Assyria and Nineveh, and you have on the holy line, the good line, the line of the woman, you have Noah, Shem, Nahor, Terah, who's the father of Abram, who marries a girl named Sarai, right? And then you have the Philistines and Sodom and Gomorrah and the Canaanite tribes and Goliath versus, versus Jacob and Israel, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, Moses, Joshua, Deborah, Gideon, Ruth, Boaz. You see where this is going. This is the whole Bible. Ahab and Jezebel and all the evil kings of Israel, although they're in the proper genetic line, right? Their children, not Jezebel, but Ahab and all the other evil kings of Israel, genetically, biologically, right, they can trace their lineage to who? Abraham. But they switch sides ideologically and theologically. Are you tracking? And become a part of the lineage of the serpent, right? And then you have the false prophets versus the true prophets. And you have Babylon and Persia and Greece and Rome. And, and in contrast, you have the prophets crying out to Israel and saying, Do not whatever you do. Do not worship the gods of those fallen powers. Then you have Israel in captivity, and you have Rome that is dominating during part of Israel's captivity. Are you with me? And then Jesus comes. Why Jesus? Because he's the seed singular that it was all about from Genesis 3.15 forward, pointing forward, right? Then you have apostate Israel apostate Christianity, and the lake of fire. Story complete on that level of the lineage versus the apostles and the founding of the apostolic church, which is new Israel. And then you have in Revelation, the remnant of the woman's what? Seed. Story comes full circle from Genesis 3.15 now to Revelation chapter 12 and the new Jerusalem. Now, the point that's being made here is illustrated excellently by, by a theologian, or a Bible student at least, and an artist, a graphic artist, who put their heads together and they said, man, what's going on in the Bible? And that they came up with is that the Bible is composed of approximately, listen to this, 62,000 parts of the story from Genesis through to Revelation that are hyperlinking with one another. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So all the themes that were initiated in Genesis, serpent, woman, marriage, all the themes, promise, covenant, Abraham, Sarah, all the themes that were initiated in Genesis are worked out through the narrative with 62,000 plus cross-references, and they've illustrated that with this particular graphic. Now, these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt, and their names are given. I'm not going to read all their names for two reasons. Number one, because there's no point, and number two, because some of them are not pronounceable. <laughs> you know that. Okay. But here's the point that you need to get as you read those names. We are not primarily dealing with biological lineage. That element begins with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But people start switching sides, and very quickly the issue becomes theology, by which we mean picture of God. What is your picture of God? That's your theology. Theology and what do you think the next thing is? we have a, not a biological lineage, but a theological and a character lineage. Now, even those on God's side in the war between good and evil, I mean, think of David, think of Solomon. You wouldn't let them babysit your kids. 
But they're, they're the good guys in the story, right? And, and these are the guys that are constantly in the process of coming out of Egypt, psychologically, emotionally, relationally. David slipped into Egypt, into oppression, into bondage, into doing dastardly deeds that he ought not to have done, only to be, read Psalm 51, to come out of, quote-unquote, Egypt, and to be redeemed for the holy purpose of God. And I'm going to suggest to you that it's not just a biological lineage, it's primarily a biographical lineage. Biography means story. So it is a covenant identity that is on display in the biblical story, not an ethnic identity. God doesn't favor any one, any one ethnicity above another ethnicity. God is in covenant relationship with humanity in mass, in in, in total, and inviting people to switch sides from the serpent's lineage to the woman's lineage, which is the lineage of Christ. So you could think about it like this. This is helpful for me. I brought this from home. I knew I would need it. Okay, think of Israel like this. Israel, if I were you, I would put this in my notes if you can get it fast enough, or just take a photo, I guess. Israel, think of Israel as a carrier lineage. What? A carrier lineage. Have you ever seen, have you, you've been on Highway 75 and you see all these semi-trucks? What are they doing? They're carrying something from point A to point Z, wherever point Z happens to be, right? Israel is a carrier lineage transporting the covenant promise down through the ages. God made a promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? And it goes on. And here, they're, they're, they're carrying precious cargo. They fail. They make mistakes. They commit sins. They apostatize. They repent. But they still have what Paul calls the oracles of God. And they're just carrying them down, passing it on, passing it on. They are the, the lineage, the carrier lineage that is producing and preserving the Holy Scriptures. You and I would not have the Bible in our hands right now if it were not for God calling Abraham out of Babylon and then through Abraham's lineage giving us prophets who wrote, who then the Hebrew people carried those scriptures down through the ages. They are a carrier lineage who are telling the story of God's plan for the world. Birthing, finally, the climactic point of the narrative, right? birthing the seed, singular, the Messiah, the Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer, birthing the seed finally into the world through the womb of woman. I will put enmity between serpent, your offspring, and the offspring of the woman. And the woman becomes the means through which God redeems the world. So we come back to chapter 1 of Exodus, and this gets very interesting. All those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already there in Egypt. And Joseph died, and his brothers, and all their generation, they died. But the children of Israel were, notice the language. If you've read Genesis at all, this is going to trigger something in your mind, in your narrative memory, right? But the children of Israel, what were they? They were fruitful, and they increased abundantly, and they multiplied, and they grew exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Do you see where Exodus 1 is quoting from? Take a guess. Take a guess. Genesis 1. God created the man and the woman, and he said to them, hey, here's what you're going to do. You're going to be fruitful, and you're going to multiply, and you're going to fill the land and subdue it. You're going to steward the land. The whole earth was to be filled with human beings who were never to ever participate in the fall that we have as a part of the story. So this is an echo of Genesis 1 and 2. So in chapter 1 of Exodus, the two words, two of the words, but the two key words that I highlighted for you are descendants and land. 
lineage, offspring, seed, people. Just call it people. People and property. People and property. This is what the story of the Bible is about. And so you finally, you come all the way to the New Testament, and there's a big, giant exchange of property ownership. When Jesus comes and he says, the meek shall inherit Israel? The promised land in Can No, the earth. The whole earth is brought back under human stewardship by the redemptive work of Christ. The land in Genesis and Exodus, watch this, the land is a territory under dispute. And the people are a territory under dispute. I mean, picture in your imagination planet Earth, one of the best photos that you've ever seen, whatever it was, of planet Earth from space. Just picture that photo and then picture the human brain. This is the great controversy between good and evil. Territory under dispute, planet Earth. Territory under dispute, your frontal lobe, your brain. The people are a territory under dispute. Now there arose a new king, verse 8 of Exodus 1. There arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. Now this is interesting because scholars look at this and they say, why are so many people, pretty much everybody in the story of Exodus, why are they named? Everybody is named with a specific name. The women who, who draw the, 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 the little Moses in his little, in his little ark out of the river, Miriam, the sister of Moses. His mother is named. The father is named. The Pharaoh's never named. Now, some scholars say that this has a literary point. This is Robert Alter in the five books of Moses, his commentary on the Pentateuch. And he says that this, this refusal to identify the specific Pharaoh, refusal to identify him by name. This has the effect of casting him as the archetype, archetypical evil king in a confrontation between the forces of good and evil. In other words, the story of Exodus isn't merely about what's happening right there historically locally on that piece of land called Egypt. It's about a much larger conflict between the forces of good and evil. And again, Pharaoh is just the host, the vehicle, the representative of the lineage. Just like Israel is the carrier of the covenant promise of God down through history, Pharaoh and others are the carrier of the ideological, theological ideas that were planted in the psyche of Adam and Eve in the fall of mankind. Yahweh in the story is the protagonist. That word simply means he is the main character on stage in the story. This is, this is Moses. I mean, this is Yahweh, and he is the main character. Pharaoh's the antagonist in the story. He's the, the one who is aligning himself against Yahweh and the plan and purposes of Yahweh. Now watch this. When Pharaoh is described in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, and he said to his people, this is Pharaoh, the, the, the archetype of evil. Not just Pharaoh, one dude doing something, but this guy who is the embodiment of the serpent's ideology and plan. And he said to his people, look, the people the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal how? Shrewdly with them, lest they, what's the problem here? What's he trying to prevent? Lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they join with our enemies and they fight against us and they go out of the, well, again, the land. Well, this is an echo of Genesis 3. Now, the serpent was more shrewd, more cunning, more subtle, depending on what version you're reading, than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And so here, again, 
The story of Exodus is deliberately reaching back into Genesis to make sense out of what's happening in the current story. This is the cosmic war between good and evil on display in the book of Exodus. It's not just a local event with a couple of local tribal lords that are warring, Moses and Pharaoh. This is the cosmic war between good and evil. The shrewd serpent back in Genesis chapter 3, right? He pulled off a coup, a usurpation of power. What did he do? It was a land grab. He took governmental control of planet Earth and the rest of the story in Scripture represents him in that position. He is called by Jesus himself the prince of this world, the ruler of this world. Paul calls him the god of this age. It was a land grab. Pharaoh, in the story, is the seed of the serpent. He's in that lineage. He's the agent of the hostile dem uh, demonic overlords that are called in the book of Exodus the gods of Egypt. Now, when we read about God, Yahweh in Scripture, we often think, yeah, he exists. This is the actual existing Yahweh God, the only true God of the universe. And then when we read about the gods, we think, oh, those are figments of people's imagination. And they make little figurines and put them on a shelf, right? But that's not exactly what's going on in Scripture. The gods are not figments of the people's imaginations. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12, and I'll just say this ever so quickly, there are 14 times in the book of Exodus, 14 times, where the gods of Egypt are brought into the narrative. I'm not going to flesh this out in detail with Exodus 12, 12, because David is going to flesh this out and everything that we're talking about is going to be further developed as we go. But in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike the firstborn of all the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I'm Yahweh. What's happening here? What he I'm just going to knock over all the little toy figurines on the Egyptians' shelves? Or is there something beyond this is going on? Look at this, chapter 15, verse 11. Who is like you, O Yahweh, among the gods? What? Aren't you the only god? There aren't any other gods, are there? Who is like you, glorious in holiness? You're different. You're distinct. You're not like them. You're fearful in praises, and you do wonders. You're distinct from all of them. Chapter 18, verse 11. For I know that Yahweh is greater than all the little toy figurines on the Egyptian shelves. Greater than all the gods, not just of Egypt now, but all the gods. For in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, these gods apparently behave. How do they behave? Proudly, right? He, that is Yahweh, was what? Above them. He's not like them. This is the theme. This is the point. And then we come to the Ten Commandments, which I'll be dealing with um, in the next to the last part, of, part 11, I think, of this series. You shall have no other gods before me. Really? Are there any? Why do you have to say that? What, what do you, Lord, what, what? Okay, check this out, you guys. Do not invoke the names of other gods. This is chapter 23, verse 13. Do not let them be heard even on your lips. Why? Is God a narcissistic control freak? I mean, why is he saying, don't even take their names to your lips? You shall not bow down to their gods. Why? Nor serve them. Why? Nor do according to their works. Don't worship those gods. It will alter your identity. It will change who you are. You are malleable. You are, what are the social scientists and psychologists calling it now? Neuroplasticity. Your frontal lobe is Plato. 
it's clay. Don't worship those gods because if you do, you will become like them. You will start to act in ways you don't want to act. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. What kind of snare will it be? Do not play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods. Well, we discover later on in the biblical narrative what kind of sacrifices these are. So who are these gods? Well, according to the biblical narrative, Psalm 106, verses 36 and 37, they served their idols, okay, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to who? Demons. Now, if you know, if you pan out and you know the rest of the biblical narrative, who are, the, who are demons? What, were they always demons? What did they used to be according to the Bible? They used to be beautiful, glorious, intelligent angels in the presence of God. And one third of those angels participated with Lucifer in his fall and became what Scripture calls demons. So who are the, the idols of the nations? They're demons. They shed innocent blood the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with their blood. Now, the gods of Egypt are not named in Scripture, but here are all the names of the demons or the fallen angels masquerading as deities in the biblical narrative. Molech, Dagon, Ishtar, Baal, Marduk, and Chemosh are gods that are named in Scripture. Are they properly ontologically, intrinsically gods? No. They're fallen angels masquerading as deities in order to dominate and to enslave and to degrade human beings in moral worth by dastardly works, behaviors like human sacrifice and other such things that are named in Scripture. And then in Psalm, check this out, in Psalm 115, verse 8, those who make them, that is, idols and worship these false gods, what will happen to them? They become like them. Don't trust in those gods. Why? Is God, again, I'm asking, is God a narcissist? No. God is saying, no, 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 no. If you, if you look at me, if you behold me, if you worship me, you'll become, you'll become ennobled morally. You'll become kind and generous and you, you'll, you'll become forgiving and you'll become like me if you worship me. But if you worship them, you will become like them. Proud, arrogant, domineering. You will become what it is that you hold in highest esteem at the highest position of your thinking. You will gravitate to the character of that highest plane. Exodus is a story of cosmic war between Yahweh and fallen angels masquerading as gods. That's the story of the book of Exodus. And that's why the book of Exodus, when you pan out far enough in that hyperlinked text that is the Bible, you finally encounter a cosmic level war and a cosmic level redemption. It's not merely local and historical. It takes in all of us. Chapter 1 again, verses, verse 11. Therefore, they, that is the Egyptians, under the power of Pharaoh, who's under the power of the gods, who are fallen angels, who are doing the bidding of Satan, Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons, to quote Jesus. Therefore... They, the Egyptians, set taskmasters over them to afflict them with burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithom and Ramses. So, Pharaoh and the Egyptians are acting out the implications of their worship system. By bringing others into bondage. But the more they afflicted the Israelites, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in dread of the children 
of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve with rigor. Bondage, slavery, oppression is the final outworking of the principle of sin. Evil in all its forms, whether you live anciently, historically in Egypt, and you're an Israelite or not, you and I, this evening, we ourselves are in danger of bondage, mentally, emotionally, relationally, addictions, obsessions, relational dynamics of domineering control. I mean, are you Pharaoh in your marriage? Are you Pharaoh in your family? Are you Pharaoh in your church board? Are you Pharaoh in your community? Are you Pharaoh among your siblings? I think you get the point. We're not exempt from the dynamics that are going down in this book. So Pharaoh commanded all his people saying, this is so tragic, it's heart-wrenching, every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall let live. Kill the sons. That's the final message of chapter 1 of Exodus. Now I skipped over the heroic acts of the women because Jeffrey threatened me because he wants to deal with the women. He's a ladies' man. And, and so I said, hey, you, Jeffrey, you can have that part of chapter one. He said, I, I must have it. Because he's got some really good points to make, apparently, and I'm looking forward to it. Check this out. We come to the end of Exodus chapter one, and the message is kill the sons. Why? You know the story now. You know why. Why kill the sons? Because I will put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, between your seed and her seed, lineage, lineage, and there's going to be a son who's going to be born ultimately through the womb of woman when the set time has fully come, Galatians chapter 3, God sent his son. Born of a woman, born under the law, to what? To redeem those under the law that we might receive the adoption of sonship, and that includes all the sisters. Children of God. The whole point of the book of Exodus is to birth the Messiah, the Savior, the Redeemer into the world. Whatever we encounter, and we're going to encounter, to use a, I'm from Southern California, <laughs> this is a surfer term, a skateboarding term, we're going to encounter some gnarly stuff <laughs> in the book of Exodus. But whatever we encounter in Exodus, Christ is the final point to which all of it was pointing all along. Jesus is the point of the book of Exodus. And so, in summary, this is what we're about to encounter in 12 sessions. I hope you'll attend them all and engage in this tour de force Bible study through the book of Exodus. Is it going to be exciting? And we're going to lose weight. So, check this out. Exodus in three movements. Chapters 1 through 18 is the story of liberation, which is summarized in the mandate, let my people go. Chapters 19 through 24 describes the vocation, the job description of Israel as they come out of Egypt God gives them a task, a job, and he says to them, you're, gonna be, you're going to be for me, to me, on my behalf, a kingdom of priests, mediators to the other nations, showing the other nations who are dominated by these fallen angels who are demons who are pretending to be deities. You come out of Egypt, and I'm going to give you a vocation of mediation to the other nations, and your job is going to be to show them that Yahweh is superior in character 
to all the other would-be gods. And finally, chapters 25 through 40, I'm summarizing with the word consecration, which is actually used in the text. You can look at it. We'll look at it in greater detail later. Consecration, and that is where the children of Israel, having received their vocation, are gathered to the base of Mount Sinai, and God gives his law of love, and the tabernacle is built, and the constant word that is used to describe what's happening here is holiness, separateness, distinction. Not in an arrogant, we're better than you kind of way, but in a vocational kind of way. We have a job to do. People need to know Jesus. People need to know Yahweh as distinct from everything else that is on offer in the world. He is superior to everything and everybody. If you fall in love with him, you fall in love with love itself. And so we are consecrated through the law and through the sanctuary and educated in the ways of holiness. This, my friends, is the book of Exodus. Thanks for your time.